you, Giacomo, for, where did you go? There you went. <laughs> you moved on me. <laughs> for the invite. I'm glad to be here, part of this session. So, um, and the, um, we did some um, musical authors on this paper for various reasons. So, uh, the first author now is Christy Primo, who could not be here, who's at the University of Albany. Um, and uh, then it's myself and David Witt, who's at Buffalo, and then Graham Goodwin, who is uh, an MA student at Nebraska. For decades now, researchers have been applying GIS to examine the roles of, move, of visibility and movement in the past. However, few studies have investigated the role sound potentially played in structuring experiences in ancient landscapes. To begin to fill this gap, this paper builds on our initial investigations into sensory GIS to develop new geospatial methods and virtual reality applications to examine ancient acoustics in conjunction with vision. Our case study is the ancient Maya. For the ancient Maya, sound worked in concert with other senses to create experiences that influence daily life and shape society. The Maya regarded senses as invisible phenomena that invested life and meaning to spaces. Sensory organs like eyes were believed to possess a form of agency, as illustrated by the protruding eyeballs in this slide. Sight was believed to have a witnessing function and an authorizing gaze, as well as affording high status. Scripts were meant to be read aloud, and speech and sound scrolls illustrate the importance of changing volume in vocal readings or performance. Researchers have argued that Maya art and architecture was a means of bringing together the senses to structure experiences that communicated cultural information. And our research begins to test this idea using GIS and VR to investigate sights and sounds at the ancient Maya city of Copan. Today, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Honduras, Copan was, from the 5th to 9th centuries, uh, the center of a kingdom that at its peak extended over 250 square kilometers. Located at the southeast periphery of the Maya world, it was an important cultural and commercial crossroads. You see the arrow down here. One of its most important kings, a ruler 13, Washakun Uba Kawil, who ruled the Copan Kingdom from 695 CE until he was decapitated by a nearby vassal state in 738, is known for introducing high relief stela and sculpture to the city. In fact, scholars hypothesize that he initiated an urban renewal campaign. One of his most dramatic changes was enclosing the city's great plaza with bleachers and erecting seven stela in this area. The scholar Elizabeth Newsom has argued that he erected these stela to create a ritual circuit that he traversed in public performances. So one objective of our research is to investigate the potential role of sound and sight in ruler stela 13's circuit. Who could see the performance as he walked from stela to stela? Who could hear it? Were they one and the same? What might the results tell us about Maya performance and targeted audience? A second objective is to explore changes through time in Copan's urban fabric. In addition, to, in addition to overhauling the Great Plaza, Ruler 13 also commissioned one of the city's most impressive temples, Temple 22. Situated in the east court of the Acropolis, Temple 22 was supposedly elevated to give it broad visibility, while making it simultaneously difficult to access. As our historian Jennifer von Schwerin argues, to access the temple, one had to move through the city, climb at least 30 meters to the top of the Acropolis, and be channeled through corridors before arriving at this temple. There we go. But what happens to the aura, atmosphere, and performance spaces of the Acropolis 25 years later, when ruler 16, Copan's final dynastic king, commissions at least four new buildings in the Acropolis? How is the visibility and acoustics of rural royal performance affected? To explore these two scenarios, we employ a three-step approach. Step one, data creation involving LIDAR, GIS, and 3D modeling to perform computational analysis on a simulated landscape, ancient landscape, rather than the contemporary landscape. Step two, calculate visibility and noise propagation using GIS. And finally, in step three, to allow a deeper engagement with Copan's past landscape, we're working to use the GIS-derived data to design a VR experience that combines sound and vision. 
As we are aware, the acquisition of large and comprehensive data sets using, for example, airborne LIDAR is changing our perspectives of ancient landscapes and, important, importantly, encouraging fresh lines of inquiry. And this is really, at the moment, really happening quickly in the Maya region. <laughs> so. But while revealing archaeological sites beneath Central America's dense canopy, airborne, airborne LIDAR provides terrain models of modern surfaces and captures extant features. That is, it captures the modern landscape. How to analyze sight and sound of the past, in order to do that, we need to actually simulate the ancient landscape in some ways. So what you're basically seeing here is after the vegetation is removed from the main, main civic ceremonial precinct at Copan, this is what you see today. So kind of just notice the sort of, you know, the mounds here. These are unexcavated areas, unexposed. So here what you're looking at um, is a photo of an archaeological mound from Copan. So one of the LIDAR ones that you're seeing, this is what you're seeing of, of a photo of. Most of the ancient buildings at Maya cities now look like this. And with the LIDAR data, um, this is what we've captured, the present. If we were to perform visibility and acoustic analysis with these 3D data, we'd be using present day mound height and not original building heights, right? And this is a problem. To examine visibility and sound in the past, we need to simulate the past landscape. This process involves various data sources and steps, and is not the point of today's talk. <laughs> so, but um, in order to talk about the GIS modeling uh, part today, uh, I just want to point out that one of the most important data sets that we generate from multiple data sets is what's known as an urban digital elevation model, or an urban DEM. And the goal of this is to, is to seek to simulate Copan's ancient landscape at specific points in time. So in this way, what you end up with is a representation as raster data of Copan that allows us to perform quantitative analysis for visibility and sound. So here, what you're just seeing is a hill shape derived from the urban DEM of Copan's main civic ceremonial group in the late 8th to early 9th centuries. So this is basically uh, during the reign of Ruler 16. So now that we have this urban DEM, and we have lots of other georeference data layers, we employ GIS to generate sound sheds and view sheds. So um, as mentioned in the previous talk, right, many of us are familiar with um, uh, view sheds. So today I'm really only going to talk a little bit about the background of acoustics. Although the sounds produced and experienced by cultures have changed over time, we can reliably model the propagation of sound because it behaves according to physics. Modeling the spread of sound follows the basic laws governing waves and particle dispersion. The temperature of the air or other media through which sound pressures, pressure waves travel determines the speed of sound. So for example, sound travels at 343.9 meters per second in 21 degrees Celsius weather, and it travels slower in cooler temperatures. So given this basic principle, sound shed modeling was completed using a sound shed analysis tool written with Python programming in ArcGIS. This example shows the lines of script that are used to calculate the Fresnel number used in the variation attenuation formula to measure the transmission of sound through and around barriers. So to run the sound shed analysis tool in GIS, the user must input nine parameters. These consist of seven variables, plus an elevation raster data set, and at least one study location saved as a feature, oh, not a feature, point feature, <laughs> class. The variables fall into two classes, environmental data and sound source information. Environmental data for the study location includes air temperature, percentage of relative humidity, and the ambient sound pressure level of the study location. The second group of data include the height of the sound source, sound pressure level of the source in decibels, distance at which the sound pressure level of the source was measured, and the frequency in hertz of the sound source. Now that we have some basic information on acoustics <laughs> and we have the GIS tool to work with, we'll show some of the initial results from these two key case, case studies or scenarios that we presented. So in scenario one, we examined the acoustics of the Great Plaza Stila circuit using a person's raised voice as the sound source. So we run sound sheds for each of the seven Stila and for the top of structure 10L4, um, which is in the middle, kind of in the middle there, the Great Plaza. 
This map shows in yellow the audibility of a speaker located at Stila C, proposed to be the start of this Stila circuit. In contrast, this map shows the full extent of the soundscape for the Stila circuit during Ruler 13's reign. So listeners would need to be within the hatched area of the plaza to hear Ruler 13's raised voice as he traversed from Stila to Stila. However, audibility at each vantage point changed as he would have moved or whomever the speaker might have been. In scenario two, we create and compare sound sheds and view sheds for two time periods the reign of Ruler 13 and the reign of Ruler 16, in order to investigate the impact of a massive building campaign in uh, this part of the city by Ruler 16. The case study is a proposed procession route moving counterclockwise, as is common among the ancient Maya, from the west court to the east court, and we're using, in this case, a conch shell trumpet as the sound source. So let's take a quick look at the differences between the two, uh, between two procession points during Ruler 13's reign. So here is the sound shed from point 11. I know these are all very um, intuitive things, but <laughs> I hopefully you can see it there, which is basically at the, the plaza in the east court of the plaza in the central part of the plaza floor. Um, and so this map shows that sound propagates to the southeast and the northwest from this location. If we move on to the next uh, spot in the proposed procession route, which is in the midway on a set of stairs, um, which is called the Jaguar Stairway, um, we can see that sound propagates in different directions, this, in this case to the north and south, so potentially targeting different audiences. Moving on to show the full extent of the soundscape for the Acropolis procession during Ruler 13's reign, we know that the conch shell wouldn't have been heard in all locations throughout the procession. However, listeners within the hatched area were able to hear the procession at some time or as it advanced from place to place. These results indicate that anyone in the Great Plaza, the elite suburb of El Bosque to the west, the elite complex to the north, as well as hilltop areas to the southeast, would have been part of this experience. However, interestingly, those in the eastern part of the city, which is a very exclusive elite area, would have been excluded from this in terms of sound. So here, uh, we now see the soundscape created using a conch shell for ruler 16 um, with the same points. So, so basically, this is a comparison of those last two uh, that I showed you. Um, and basically between, so it's the sound sheds of ruler 13 and ruler 16. And so one of the most interesting differences in the audibility of the Acropolis procession is the sound shed um, is in the sound is the final location of the sound shed, which is really the highest point on this procession route. So here, what we can see is that there's been a notable reduction in the audible area for Ruler 13's time, which is indicated in the red outline, to the audible areas for Ruler 16, indicated in yellow. So basically, if we calculate area for the two view sheds from this point, the results indicate that the sound shed for Ruler 13 is approximately 209,655 thousand square meters, whereas the sound shed for Ruler 16 is reduced by about 25% to 157,709 square meters. To bring vision into this picture, during Ruler 13's reign, people standing in blue areas could see the procession atop the Jaguar dance platform, while those in yellow areas could hear it but not see it, and those within the red outline could see but not hear. In contrast, during Ruler 16's reign, both visibility and audibility of the Acropolis procession was reduced. So while we haven't had much time to delve into all of these results and data, and there are a lot more, <laughs> um, initial interpretations highlight some interesting findings. For example, while the Stila circuit is located in the highly accessible Great Plaza at the intersection of two causeways and held seats for several thousand people, the performances in this space would have been less visible than those held in the elevated but highly restricted Acropolis, perhaps reflecting the Maya notion that to see or to overlook was associated not only with higher status, but also to enforce the notion that to be all-seeing was all-knowing. So while only some select elite were allowed to actually participate in the Acropolis processions, a much larger group of group of people were allowed to view and hear snapshots of the event, making them part of the performance, but yet not fully a part of it. A second interesting result is the shifting pattern from Ruler 13 to Ruler 16. 
We've seen that the elite complex at El Bosque was included in the Acropolis Circus Soundshed, not circus, circuit, <laughs> Soundshed during Ruler 13's reign, but that subsequent modifications precluded the people living in this area from hearing as much of the circuit as they previously did. While we don't argue that this was done intentionally, this change may have been merely the side effect of this construction, it does illustrate that the observation of the Acropolis circuit was not foremost in the mind of Ruler 16 as he modified architecture in this part of the Acropolis. So we continue to explore these GIS results, um, but simultaneously, um, we're moving uh, from, or between, I should really say, it's iterative, this computational realm to the experiential realm. And to do so, we make use of virtual reality. Our main objective is to use VR to integrate sights and sounds because knowledge of the world, that is our experiences, are enhanced by interactions of the visual and auditory systems as others as well. Currently, we're using the gaming engine Unity, the Oculus Rift headset, um, the Lead Motion Touch, and Deer VR, which is a Unity plugin that simulates spatial sound for this research. For this part of the talk, I'm basically just going to show you a few videos. Um, the first one is just going to be a procession route showing you that walkthrough that I've been talking about um, from the west to east court, but in the VR rather than the GIS uh, world. And then we'll move to sound after that. <laughs> Okay, so what you're seeing here, this would be the, if you assume that the procession route moves counterclockwise, you are in the um, west court right now of the Acropolis, which is elevated up high, and the procession route will move this way through this um, space, this corridor, which is tightly, uh, it's somewhat restricted, and you'd be headed this way. Um, and I have to say that this is the visualization, um, well, it's a combo right now, but primarily what it has are the structures from Ruler 16. We haven't we removed them from Ruler 13 yet. So a lot of the stuff that you're seeing here wouldn't have actually been here for Ruler 13. But when we did the analysis in the GIS, we removed those data. So, so you'd walk in, you'd see this is Temple 22, and you'd walk in through this space um, here in this area. Okay, so that's just some of the, to get an idea. And, and, then, and when you have the, many of you I'm sure have used the Oculus, when you have this on your head, it, it changes your entire experience. Um, okay, so this is the sort of the, that's the visual part. Whoops, come back. So the next thing is to introduce sound into the experience. So play this one. So you're, no, it's not yet supposed to work, don't worry. <laughs> So this is the idea, as we're walking closer and closer to the sound source, it gets louder and louder when we go towards it. And so the sound source, you can have different um, decibels, like except, you know, different sources in there, um, and you place it in with the spatial sound and the head tracking of the plugin, as you get closer to where it might be, it gets louder and louder. Nearly done. <laughs> My iPad seems to have decided to go on its own. Okay. So ancient Maya paintings, like the Bonham Pox murals, depict trumpeteers, drummers, and other musicians taking part in processions. Other archaeological evidence of sound exists in the form of musical instruments, such as shell trumpets, ceramic whistles, and wooden drums. And finally, hieroglyphs ind give indication of the roles of sound. We hope that our research can add to this body of evidence by de developing computational and experiential approaches to investigate the roles of vision and sound in differentially shaping experiences of ancient Maya peoples. So, um, so our research is in the early stages, um, and the future directions of research have three kind of main areas. The first is um, additional development of the GIS model to include ecosystem factors. We have that developed in the system, but we didn't feel comfortable with the coefficients that we were using for different places. Anyway, it goes back to the paleoenvironmental issues. Um, as well as the impact variables of construction materials. So we, there's been arguments that the plaster used on the buildings helped acoustics. So we're working on integrating those into the formulas. Second, um, develop a workflow for bringing the quantitative acoustic data from the GIS into the VR. Right now, what we've done is collected sound data in the field, macaws and other kinds of things, and we're bringing those into the system, but it's not a, it's not a straight flow, workflow process. 
And then the third, and perhaps most importantly, um, is bringing people into it all, <laughs> right? As you see, there are no people in here, right? We're talking about performances. So we've, we've begun to model the impact of audience size on the acoustics using other 3D uh, modeling software. Um, and so basically, the size of the audience impacts the, the propagation of noise and other things. So those data as well, we're working to um, bring into the GIS process and we're trying to figure out how to connect the two at the moment. Um, so basically, I just want to end with one last quick video here. Uh, it's very short, just to sort of give you an idea of um, your so this is a reconstruction of the funerary monument or temple of ruler um, 16. It was done by actually a, a master student at uh, Bonn uh, here in Germany um, using lots of different data, but it's a little, the lighting isn't great. But what we have is we had talked about the leap motion. It allows you basically like the connect, right? You could, but you wear it on the oculus. Um, or you could use the touch handles as well. Um, but it allows you, we have it, you can pick up a torch and move it around and get the raking light, but we also are combining the sound of the, the fire as well with it. So you can move through the space um, and go down into the, the tomb, which um, here in other areas. So we have a, a night version, a day version, etc. So, um, oh, okay. so, oh, thank you very much. <laughs>